The Great Second Advent Movement by J. N. Lofborough, Chapter 22. Organization. For this cause I left thee in Crete that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting and ordain elders in every city as I had appointed thee. Titus 1, verse 5. In the advancement of the third angel's message, twelve years had passed from 1846 to 1858 before our people seemed to realize the necessity for any more formal association than simply the belief of the truth in Christian love. Although the Lord had spoken to his people upon this subject through the gift of prophecy, it seemed to require some adverse experiences to arouse them fully to a sense of the necessity of the organization of conferences and churches and associations for the management of the temporalities of the cause. Opposition to Organization In a footnote on page 12 of Supplement to Experience and Views, published in 1853, Elder James White says, After the time passed in 1844, there was great confusion, and the majority were opposed to any organization holding that it was inconsistent with the perfect liberty of the gospel. Mrs. White was always opposed to every form of fanaticism and early announced that some form of organization was necessary to prevent and correct confusion. Few at the present time can appreciate the firmness which was then required to maintain her position against the prevailing anarchy. Close quote. The union which had existed among Seventh-day Adventists has been greatly fostered and maintained by her timely warnings and instructions. George Storrs on Organization The following from George Storrs, written in 1844, will show what was taught concerning organization to those who had separated themselves from the churches under the Advent Proclamation. Quote, Take care that you do not seek to organize another church. No church can be organized by man's invention, but what it becomes Babylon the moment it is organized. The Lord organized his own church by the strong bonds of love, stronger than that cannot be made. And when such bonds will not hold together the professed followers of Christ, they cease to be his followers and drop off from the body as a matter of course. Close quote. Midnight Cry, February 15, 1844. Order in Apostolic Times Seventh-day Adventists, as before stated, were without a former organization of any kind for many years, not even having a church organization. Any person who had moral courage to accept the truth and obey it under the outside pressure of opposition which then existed was considered honest and worthy of Christian love and fellowship. There came a time in the days of the apostles when it became necessary to set in order the things that were wanting. Titus 1 verses 5 through 9. About 65 AD, Titus was authorized to obtain elders in every city where there were believers, and Timothy received quite full instructions on the subject, 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 through 15. Elder White on Organization The following from Elder James White upon the subject of organization and discipline appeared in the review of January 4, 1881. Quote, Organization was designed to secure unity of action and as a protection from imposture. It was never intended as a scourge to compel obedience, but rather for the protection of the people of God. Christ does not drive his people. He calls them. My sheep hear my voice. I know them, and they follow me. Our living head leads the way and calls his people to follow. Human creeds cannot produce unity. Church force cannot press the church into one body. 
Christ never designed that human minds should be molded for heaven by the influence of other human minds. The head of every man is Christ. His part is to lead and to mold and to stamp his own image upon the heirs of eternal glory. However, important organization may be for the protection of the church and to secure harmony of action, it must not come in to take the discipline from the hands of the master. Unity between two extremes. Between the two extremes of church force and unsanctified independence, we find the grand secret of unity and efficiency in the ministry and in the church of God. Our attention is called to this in a most solemn appeal from the venerable Apostle Peter to the elders of his time. Quote, the elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness to the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that should be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves to the elder. Yea, all of you be subject to one another, and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud, and giveth grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Close quote, 1 Peter 5, verses 1 through 6. Simplicity and form of New Testament organization. Those who drafted the form of organization adopted by Seventh-day Adventists labored to incorporate into it, as far as possible, the simplicity of expression and form found in the New Testament. The more of the spirit of the gospel manifested, and the more simple, the more efficient, the system. The General Conference takes the general supervision of the work in all of its branches, including the state conferences. The state conferences takes the supervision of all the branches of the work in the state, including the churches in the state. And the church is a body of Christians associated together with the simple covenant to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Church officers are servants. The officers of a local church are servants of that church and not lords to rule over it with force. He that is greatest among you shall be your servant. Matthew 23, verse 11. These officers should set examples of patience, watchfulness, prayer, kindness, and liberality to the members of the church and should manifest a good degree of that love to those whom they serve that is exhibited in the life and teachings of our Lord. Close quote. The first testimony on order. In the supplement to Experience in Views, published in 1853, some special instruction is given upon the subject of gospel order. On page 15, we read the following, quote, the church must flee to God's word and become established upon gospel order which has been overlooked and neglected. This is indispensably necessary to bring the church into the unity of faith. Close quote. Order needed near the end. In a testimony given December 23, 1860, we read, quote, As we near the close of time... Satan comes down with great power, knowing that his time is short. Especially will his power be exercised upon the remnant. He will war against them and seek to divide and scatter them that they may grow weak and be overthrown. The people of God should move understandingly and should be united in their efforts. They should be of the same mind, of the same judgment. Then their efforts will not be scattered, but will tell forcibly on the upbuilding of the cause of present truth. 
order must be observed, or there must be union in maintaining order, or Satan will take advantage of them. Close quote. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, Number 6, page 210. Order of the Angels to be Imitated In Testimony Number 14, published in 1868, we read, quote, The more closely we imitate the harmony and order of the angelic host, the more successful will be the efforts of these heavenly agents in our behalf. If we see no necessity of harmonious action, and are disorderly, undisciplined, and disorganized in our course of action, angels who are thoroughly organized and move in perfect order cannot work for us successfully. They turn away in grief, for they are not authorized to bless confusion, distraction, and disorganization. God is a God of order still. Has God changed from a God of order? No. He is the same in the present dispensation as in the former. Paul says, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. He is as particular now as then. And he designs that we should learn lessons of order and organization from the perfect order he instituted in the days of Moses for the benefit of the children of Israel. Close quote. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 1, Number 14, page 653. Christ's Prayer for Order In a testimony written in 1882, we see the same sentiment expressed in these words. Quote, that union and love might exist among his disciples was the burden of our Savior's last prayer for them prior to his crucifixion. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Close quote. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, Number 31, page 236 and 237. Danger of Individual Independence. In 1885, this testimony was given, quote, one point will have to be guarded, and that is individual independence. As soldiers in Christ's army, there should be a concert of action in the various departments of the work. Close quote. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 5, Number 33, page 534. Satan delights to overthrow order. In a special testimony published in 1895, we read, quote, Oh, how Satan would rejoice to get in among this people and disorganize the work at a time when thorough organization is essential and will be the greatest power to keep out spurious uprisings and refute claims not endorsed by the Word of God. We want to hold the lines evenly that there shall be no breaking down of the system of regulation and order. Close quote. Commendation of Ministers One of the first points to be considered in establishing order among our people in harmony with the testimonies just quoted was some mode of reorganizing those who preached the message. From 1850 to 1861, the plan adopted was that of giving the ministers who had proved their gift and were evidently approved of the Lord and in harmony with all the work a card recommending them to the fellowship of the Lord's people everywhere, simply stating that they were approved in the work of the gospel ministry. These cards were dated and signed by two of the leading ministers known by our people to be leaders in the work. Ministerial Support In the winter of 1858 to 1859, Instruction was given to the effect that the Bible contained a complete system for the support of the ministry, and that if our people would study the subject from a scriptural standpoint, 
they would find that system. Accordingly, a Bible class was held in Battle Creek over which Elder J. N. Andrews presided. After careful and prayerful study of the scriptures, an article was prepared and published in the Review of February 3, 1859, presenting a plan that embraced the principle of tithing. An address on that subject was submitted to a large gathering of our people assembled in general meeting in Battle Creek, Michigan on June 6, 1859, and unanimously adopted by a vote of the entire assembly. The established order commended. In testimony number 6, 1861, the Lord thus spoke through Mrs. White concerning the system that had been adopted by Seventh day Adventist. Quote, Rob not God by withholding from him your tithes and offerings. It is the first sacred duty to render to God a suitable proportion. Let no one throw in his claims and lead you to rob God. Let not your children steal your offerings from God's altar for their own benefit. The tithing system to develop character. This tithing system, I saw, would develop character and manifest the true state of the heart. If people have this matter presented before them in its true bearing, and they be left to decide for themselves, they will see wisdom and order in the tithing system. Close quote. In this manner, a system of finance was established among Seventh-day Adventists for supporting the work of the ministry, and it is now in use by our people all over the world. In the review of July 21, 1859, as the result of the instruction previously given through the testimonies, it was first suggested that each state hold an annual meeting in which a careful planning of the work be made and thus avoid the confusion which too commonly existed in the manner of ministerial labor and that order and system be observed in our work. This suggestion really looked forward to the formation of state conference organizations holding church property. As the message advanced and numbers increased, there naturally followed an accumulation of property, which led to the consideration of legally holding church property. In an article from Elder White, found in the Review of February 23, 1860, we read the following, quote, We hope, however, that the time is not far distant when this people will be in that position necessary to be able to get church property insured, hold their meeting houses in a proper manner, that those making wills and wishing to do so can appropriate a portion to the publishing department. We call upon our preachers and leading brethren to give the matter their attention. If any object to our suggestions, will they please write out a plan on which we as a people can act? Close quote. Legal organization endorsed. During the summer of this year, there was more or less friendly discussion of this subject in the review. And in a general gathering of representatives of our people from Michigan and several other states held in Battle Creek from September 28 to October 1st, there was a candid consideration of the subject and a full and free discussion of legal organization for the purpose of holding the office and other church property, meeting houses, etc. This discussion is found at length in the review Volume 16, Numbers 21, 22, 23, issued October 9, 16, and 27, 1860. As the result of the deliberations at this gathering, it was voted unanimously to legally organize a publishing association, and in order that such a corporation might be formed as soon as practicable, a committee of five was elected by the conference assembled a denominational name. This conference also took into consideration the subject of a name by which our people should be called. This again called forth a diversity of opinions, some pleading for one name and some for another. The Church of God being proposed, it was objected to on the ground that it gave none of the distinctive features of our faith, while the name Seventh-day Adventists would not only set forth our faith in the near coming of Christ, but would also show that we were observers of the seventh-day Sabbath. So unanimous was the assembly in favor of the latter name that when put to vote, 
only one man voted against it, and he soon afterward withdrew his objection. The name approved. In testimony number six, we read, quote, No name which we can take will be appropriate, but that which accords with our profession and expresses our faith and makes us a peculiar people. The name Seventh-day Adventist carries the true features of our faith in front and will convict the inquiring mind like an arrow from the Lord's quiver. It will wound the transgressors of God's law and will lead to repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Close quote. The effect of the testimony was to settle forever this question in the minds of the believers. The office of a true gift. Is not this the special province of a manifestation of the gifts of God's Spirit? Paul said they were placed in the church for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ, till we all come into the unity of the faith, etc. Ephesians 4, verses 12 and 13. How appropriate that after the believers have prayerfully and in humility sought for light, the Spirit should speak and say, quote, This is the way, your conclusions are correct, and then edify the church still further, as in this case, by telling them the practical bearing of the question and some of the good results that would accrue from their decisions. Church Organization In an address delivered by Elder White before the General Conference in Battle Creek in April 1861 and published in the review June 11, 1861, he introduced the idea of a more complete organization of our churches. By invitation, nine ministers held a Bible class to seek light upon the subject and were requested by the conference to publish in the review the results of that investigation. After presenting the scriptural testimony on church order and church officers, the topic of equal representation from several states in the general conference was considered, as well as proper and equal representation of churches in the state conferences. In reality, this was the first introduction of the idea of having duly elected delegates to general associations on some equal ratio that might be agreed upon. Michigan State Conference Organized October 6, 1861, the Michigan Conference was organized by the election of a chairman, a secretary, and an executive committee of three. By vote of the conference, it was recommended that the churches enter into organization adopting the following as a church covenant. Quote, we, the undersigned, hereby associate ourselves together as a church, taking the name Seventh-day Adventists, covenanting to keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus Christ. Close quote. Ministers' Credentials At this conference, it was first decided that credentials should be granted to all Seventh-day Adventist ministers in this state who were in good standing, and that ministers should carry papers consisting of a certificate of ordination and credentials signed by the chairman and clerk of the conference, which credentials should be renewed annually. It was also voted that a committee should be selected to prepare an address setting before our people the mode of procedure in organizing churches. This address was published in the review of October 15, 1861. Delegates' Credentials In the month of September 1862, the Michigan Conference held its first session in Monterey. Here, for the first time was presented the idea of receiving churches into the conferences as members were voted into churches. As 17 churches in the state had already been organized, these were, by vote, taken into the conference, and all members of these churches who were present were accepted as delegates. Ministers' Salaries it was at this conference, too, that the plan was adopted of paying ministers a certain sum per week for services rendered. The ministers, on their part, 
were required to report the time spent in labor in the conference with their receipts and expenses, and the conference receiving this report was to make proper settlement. Credentials, first presented by delegates. May 20, 1863, the General Conference was held in Battle Creek, Michigan. It was the first session of that body in which the delegates bore credentials from their respective states. The representation was not, however, on a numerical basis. The states represented on this occasion were Michigan, Wisconsin, Iowa, Minnesota, New York, and Ohio. General and State Conference Constitutions May 21, a constitution was adopted by the General Conference, and on the same day, a state constitution was recommended to the state conferences. It was adopted in a session of the Michigan Conference. These constitutions provided a numerical basis for delegate representation in the state conferences and in the General Conference. The state constitution there recommended is about the same as that used now by our 72 local conferences throughout the world. At the time of the General Conference in the spring of 1864, a recommendation was first made to the state conference that an auditing committee of laymen who had not been in the employ of the conference during the year be selected to act with the executive committee in auditing and settling accounts with ministers. Thus, step by step, as necessity required, order was established in the work and cause of God. Thus we have briefly traced the steps that led to the formal organization of the work. This was done when the denomination was very small compared with what it is at the present time. When the General Conference was fully organized in 1863, the whole number of delegates was not so large as we now have annually in some of the small local conferences. Object of Organization the object to be accomplished by organization was that the property of the body might be lawfully held and legally managed and that the laborers in the work might move in harmony without confusion because their movements were with counsel and therefore without distraction. The same principles adopted in our organization up to 1864 were incorporated into the work as it enlarged and extended to other countries and nationalities. General organizations formed. As the message advanced, the following general organizations were formed, the officers of which were elected at the regular sessions of the General Conference. The General Conference Association, a legal body of 21 members to hold the title to the property of the various institutions in America and other countries. The Foreign Mission Board, to superintend and extend mission work outside of organized conferences. The International Tract Society, whose province was the distribution of reading matter and correspondence seeking to open up new missions. The Religious Liberty Association, its special field being to aid those persecuted for conscience's sake and to circulate literature on the principles of religious liberty the International Sabbath School Association, the object of which was the building up and advancement of the Sabbath school work in all fields, the Medical Missionary and Benevolent Association, its work relating to the training of physicians and nurses, the conducting of sanitariums, homes for the orphans, the aged, etc. The field occupied up to 1868. Up to 1868, our field of operations included that portion of the United States east of the Missouri River and north of the parallel of latitude corresponding with the southern line of Missouri. At that time, the General Conference Committee had only three members, the president of the conference being one of the members. The eight local conferences were all under the supervision of the General Conference, which had its headquarters at Battle Creek, Michigan why reorganization was necessary. As the message extended to other lands, a necessity arose 
for reorganization of the entire field. Hence, steps were taken in 1897 pointing in that direction. But the work of rearranging has been more thoroughly accomplished during the last four years, in which time a European General Conference has been organized with an executive committee of 14 members and the original General Conference, with its headquarters at Washington, D.C., has an executive committee of 28 members representing all the various interests of the message and taking the place of some of the general associations which have been discontinued. Organized standing January 1, 1903. The following from the General Conference Yearbook of 1904 gives some interesting statistical facts up to January 1, 1903. At that time, our organized work consisted of two general conferences comprised of 14 union conferences, 72 local conferences, and 42 missions. These are distributed as follows. Local conferences in North America, 49. Outside of North America, 23. Union conferences in America, 8. In other countries, 6. Mission fields in America, including Alaska, Hawaii, and Newfoundland, 5. Missions outside of America, 37, located as follows. 12 in Europe, 4 in Africa, 3 in Asia, 2 in South America, 2 in South Africa, and the remainder in Central America, Mexico, West Indies, and the Pacific Islands. Connected with these missions are 67 ordained and licensed ministers and 131 churches. Unity in Diversity It is a source of encouragement to know that these different organizations in various countries and nationalities are all united in the promotion of one great cause of truth and salvation of men. Not in the mere formal machinery of organization do we trust, but in God, the author of order. With his blessing upon the united and harmonious action of his workers, we may realize how good and pleasant it is to have all things done decently and in order. This is the end of chapter 22.